Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what is algebraic geometry. Today we'll tell you once more about the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. I know I said it will not will not appear anymore, but once more we need to do it because it's such a historically very important example that I at least should tell you where it originally comes from. Um, although it will look a little bit like I'm doing topology, it's it's really what I'm what I'm going to explain is really in the intersection of algebraic geometry geometry in general and topology and it goes usually under the name a uh, Schubert calculus and it is really this idea of accounting intersections I'll make that more precise as we go along but I'm also going to tell you a little bit about uh, the history so again if you haven't seen cohomology rings or something like this doesn't really matter I give you some example which hopefully uh, is self-explanatory and then we kind of forget about it but this example of the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian is historically so important and turns up in many, many fields of mathematics that I decided to well, at least tell you a little bit about um, the history of the subject. So there is a very famous book um, from quite a while ago by now by, by Schubert, Calcul de Abzähl, uh, Abzählenden Geometrie. So um, the Calculus of Enumerative uh, Combinatorics, Geometry. And yeah, nowadays it's essentially just called Schubert calculus. Schubert calculus, and it was about so in the in the eighteen hundred seventy ish, eighteen hundred fifty ish. People were very excited about various geometric counting problems. How many x are there in y? Where something like x could be a plane and y could be a cubic or something like that. So how often does x intersect y? How often does it line generically intersect the quadric or something like this so people got very excited about those um ge geometric counting problems so nowadays called enumerative geometry and schubert wrote this book which i call uh, euler style and by, by this i mean like euler like extremely brilliant like a master of manipulation of infinite series and all that fun stuff but uh, it's not quite rigorous what Euler did. Of course, in hindsight, you can kind of, uh, well, definitely justify it. Um, but at the time, it somehow, it's somehow a little bit tricky. So Euler always did the right computations, but it's somewhat a, a bit tricky. So brilliant, but not quite rigorous, maybe. And kind of Schubert's calculus had kind of the same type of flavor. So people got very, very excited about it. I'm going to tell you in the next slide that they got really very excited about it. But somehow it was kind of felt that, that there is some um, rigor missing. Like, okay, maybe you want to make Euler's calculus precise and you need people like Cauchy and so on and this Epsilon Delta stuff and so on. Um, maybe more modern versions would actually use infinitesimals right from the start. But anyway, kind of the same happened here for Schubert calculus. So Schubert calculus, absolutely brilliant. And it's a little bit a miracle where Schubert got all these formulas from. from. But anyway, it's kind of solves all these type of intersection type questions. How many lines intersect the given plane generically in five points? Some questions on that form. And yeah, so people got really, really excited about it. And it's uh, on one of Hilbert's problems. So they're the famous Hilbert's 23 problems. And they were asked in 1900 by, by Hilbert. So 10 of them represented in the International Congress of Mathematics. And the others were then uh, a little bit later published. So those 23 problems, it's very influential. It's like the, the, the 100 uh, years earlier version of the Millennium Prize problems that you probably know very well. But they're kind of really, really important problems. And number 15 um, was the rigorous foundation of Schubert's calculus. Yeah? And it, it says partially resolved, but whatever. I claim what, but the part I'm going to talk about is resolved. Anyway, but you can see kind of how important it was. Hilbert had one question for it. And yeah, it's about the rigorous foundations of exactly what I said, like the Euler style, and you want to have some rigorous foundations for them. So it uh, took a quite some time, and there was some very interesting mathematics going into finding a rigorous foundation. Very similar to this Euler style arguments, right? There was the very interesting mathematics came out of just trying to justify Berlin calculations. It's kind of the same story here. And this is where the cohomology ring of the Grossmannian comes into the game. And that's why it's historically so important, because it somehow is 
and it's not somehow, it is related to uh, one of the most brilliant ideas in geometry um, from 18, around 1850, uh, 60, 70 ish. And the only real example I'm going to give you, um, because it gets a bit tricky, so accounting problems in general are not completely trivial, but there's one nice kind of prototypical example of what's happening. And it's really easy to understand. And then the kind of the main thing of Schubert's calculus is kind of the generalization of this picture into a kind of kind of a very general type of counting thing. So easy, easily but crucial. So I'm going into three space, and I really don't worry about uh, what I really do. Um, probably I should go to projective space, and probably should I go to complex space. But anyway, let's just think about three space. And generically. Right, to be, I try to convince you that we can get rid of this condition by going to projective space, and that's what I kind of do here anyway. So anyway, so generically, just just a geometric picture you should in, in have in mind. Two planes, and you know, here are two generic planes, and they intersect generically in a line. Not very difficult, very easy to see, and three planes generically will intersect in a point. The point is somewhere here. So generically, that's what happens. And four planes will not have any common intersection anymore. Okay. And the kind of mathematical foundation used for Schubert calculus was, was to say, okay, the cohomology ring, whatever that is, of uh, the projective space in this case, is just the polynomial ring mod x4 in this example, where x corresponds to the plane, x squared, so cohomology ring is about intersections, x squared corresponds to a line, namely the intersection, the generic intersection of two planes. x cubed is the kind of triple intersection, there's a point, and x to the 4 is dead. There's a whole point, right? x to the 4 is dead because um, the intersection doesn't work out anymore. This is kind of this rigorous foundation of an enumerative calculus, how many intersections of whatever are there. And it's all captured, at least in, in for this video, all captured in the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian, where I will come back to that example in a second and tell you that it is actually a cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. And some other solution to Hilbert's problem is given by my little list here, one, two, three, four. The cohomology ring of this Grassmannian is a certain type of ring, and it's very easy to describe, and very, very uh, kind of explicit for all n and k. There's an explicit way of doing it. Gets a bit nasty, so I'm not going to do it in, on, on a slide, but if you just open it and Google it, you will find computer programs who can do it. Um, it's kind of really explicit and it's an explicit solution to the counting problem. And this works as roughly as follows. So, not roughly, but it works as follows, but I'm not giving you the combinator. So uh, the cohomology ring is a quotient of symmetric polynomials in k variables. And I usually like to do this just saying that they fit in some box of size k. Okay, so this is this condition of having k, we'll see that in a second. And the quotient is given by annihilating the comp complete symmetric polynomial, which goes, which is one box too long. So here, this length should be n minus k, and we kill the, the symmetric polynomial, which is just one box too long, which is one, one step too long. That's the quotient. Okay, it's an explicit description of the cohomology ring in general for n and k. So symmetric polynomials, complete symmetric polynomials is easy to write down. Very good. But you can do better. You can write down the bases, that, the, the bases that correspond exactly to the subspaces you would like to intersect. And these are called the sure polynomials. I'm not going to write them down how they work, but they're explicit formulas. They're symmetric polynomials given for uh, lambda, a partition that fits into this little box. So something that fits into this box or uh, whatever. And they are very explicitly, you can write them down very explicitly, and they are very explicitly can be multiplied. They have explicit uh, structure constants. So the multiplication rule is kind of completely understood. And the keyword is kind of this little root rigid coefficients that show up as a structure constants of multiplication. And this gives us like this explicit answer to Schubert's question, to not Schubert's question, Hilbert's question, um, to, to give a kind of rigorous foundation of. Schubert calculus. And why is that? Because cohomology ring is like the intersection and the S lambdas are like the subspaces. So this is like capturing um, those. How do subspace intersect? In a very, very explicit way, the way the product corresponds to really just intersections and the coefficients do the count for you. 
So those little wood widgets and goldfish. Kind of really, really nice, uh, nice uh, kind of solution for the problem. Like very explicit. I haven't told you what those little wood widgets and coefficients are, but they are very explicit ways to I just compute them um, as well. Like everything on this slide is given very explicitly. And in my little example from before, it works as follows. So the cohomology ring is this guy, and this is actually the, the G13. Um, so K is 1, N is 3. So I will draw them, the corresponding elements in a K, so 1 by 3 box. And the things I can draw is nothing. I can draw a box, I can draw two boxes, I can draw three boxes. And the symmetric polynomial I kill is given by four boxes, the one that is one too long. And the corresponding polynomials are very easy, they just correspond to x, x squared, and x cubed in um, this case. So our alphabet is very, very tiny here, just x1 equals x in, in this case. Yeah, it's a very tiny alphabet. And then the intersection that I just showed you before is exactly uh, captured by the corresponding little bit of Richardson coefficients, which is easy in this case, obviously, and correspond exactly to the detection of planes uh, generically in, um, yeah, in three space. And in general, this works like in this example where k is 1, this works exactly in the same way, uh, where x always con corresponds to the n minus 1 um, hyperplane. And you might wonder why do I take projective space, which aligns. And I end up with x being the hyperplane. The, the, the point is that the cohomology ring dualizes everything. And you kind of, instead of taking the line, which is like the smallest non-trivial, you take the highest non-trivial, um, which is the corresponding uh, hyperplane. But anyway, so in general, if you take a hyperplane uh, in n space, then you can intersect them. And there is always like a unique intersection in a line and a point or whatever. Up to there is no intersection anymore. And this is exactly captured by the corresponding cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. And for higher k, formulas get a bit more complicated, um, as you would expect, maybe. But there's still a complete solution to that problem. And that's like the cohomology ring, uh, explicit description of the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.